And we're kicking off today with the conversation about regulating state and local education agencies. So I'm gonna start with a quick introduction of name and title only of our esteemed panelists for this round of conversations. And then we'll move, in, we'll move into some Q&A, which does include a question about their work, their scope of work, and why it's relevant to this conversation on student data and privacy. So I'm really pleased to be joined today for this conversation about state and local regulations and what it means for local education agencies. So I'm joined by Rachel Anderson, who's the Director of Policy and Research Strategy with the Data Quality Campaign. Lori Owens, who's the Chief Technology Officer at San Mateo County Office of Education. And Whitney Phillips, the Chief Privacy Officer with the Utah State Board of Education. So really bringing to light a lot of this state and local focus. Ladies, thank you for joining us today. We are really looking forward to your insights and perspectives. What I'd like to start with first is a very softball question. A little bit about your role and your approach to student data privacy. And we'll go in the order in which I introduce, introduce you. So Rachel, then Lori, then Whitney. So Rachel. Sure, thank you so much for having me and for organizing this conversation. Uh, so Noelle, as you said, uh, I'm Rachel Anderson. I'm the Director of Research and Policy at the Data Quality Campaign, uh, or DQC. Uh, so the Data Quality Campaign is a nonpartisan advocacy organization focused completely on the better use of data across education and the workforce. So we work with state, federal, and local leaders to help them make data work for students. And why we're here today, uh, data access or use and privacy are really two sides of the same coin. No one is going to use data that they can't trust as being protected. So at DQC, we work on the policy and human aspects of privacy rather than the technical or technological aspects. We help leaders think about what it means to use education data effectively and ethically, and what types of policies or practices create a world where data is a flashlight illuminating success for students. Great, Lori. Thank you very much for uh, having me today. I'm Lori Owens and I am the Chief Technology Officer for the San Mateo County Office of Education. We're located about 20 miles south of San Francisco. And we are in, in California, the county offices of education are equivalent to regional centers in many other states in our jurisdiction. We have uh, 23 school districts that we are, um, we have oversight over and that there is approximately 94, 95,000 students um, in, our, in our area. At the county office of education, um, the data uh, group, there's a data group that reports to me and one of the central things that we are uh, responsible for is student data privacy, not only for our own students, we do have some direct serve students that are primarily uh, special ed students and they're, even there, there are a lot of different uh, challenges with regards to trying to share data and do it safely and, and legally. Um, we also uh, serve incarcerated students again. Um, very sensitive data that we have to communicate, but we also have to protect. But we also provide guidance to our 23 districts in the area of student data privacy. And that's all I have for right now. Thanks. Whitney? Hi, uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you all are. I'm uh, Whitney Phillips. I'm Chief Privacy Officer at the Utah State Board of Education. That is the State Education Agency for Utah. It's just named a little differently. Uh, I um, uh, really think of privacy as having a uh, trust in uh, what we are supposed to do, uh, being very, very upfront about that. Uh, I see it as looking at policy, security, and training as being kind of the three pies that need to be, uh, or pieces of pie that need to be approached. Uh, and um, I guess uh, I guess we can talk a little bit more about that. But you know, there is a concern about privacy, and uh, there's a there's a reason why. Uh, things haven't been done properly, and uh, although educators are always well-meaning, I was an educator myself, an English teacher, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions. So people mean well, they just need the expertise to know exactly what is appropriate. So hi, nice to meet you all. 
So I think one of the most powerful things I heard said was something that Whitney just spoke to, and it's really important to the work, particularly in schools, but also around student debt and privacy, people do mean well. So as we dig in and get really upset about some of these issues, everyone is overwhelmingly focused on the good and the well and the safety of students. Uh, but that's a, I, I think you were saying it because it's your truth, but I wanted to, to pull it out for uh, specific attention. Okay, a little bit deeper in our questions now. Rachel, I want to start with you and your work at DQC. So your group has been at the forefront of educating policymakers at all levels on how student data is collected, used, and shared to help students. Can you describe at a very high level how schools typically collect and use their student data? Yes, so I'm sure my esteemed panelists will be able to give much more concrete on the ground examples in some of their later answers, but I'd love to get us started with a, a high level overview of the types of data use that we might be talking about in an education setting. Um, if folks want more information, I direct you to our website, where we actually have an infographic and a brief video appropriately titled Who Uses Student Data? Um, but the main takeaway from that resource is that everyone with a role in education needs data, but not everyone needs the same data. And that distinction is at the core of most data privacy conversations. How do we ensure that people have secure access to the role-based data they need while centering privacy to ensure that we're always using data to support students and that we're building trust in data's value and protection? So what does this look like in practice at a very high level? Um, what does it look like for different people to need different data? For example, a classroom teacher or a principal might need identifiable student level information on each of their students. So to personalize instruction and support each individual, a teacher or a principal needs to know that Joey needs more support to master fractions or Maria has missed four days of school this month. On the other hand, a state legislator does not need personally identifiable data on Joey and Maria, but they do need to know uh, some aggregated data to know that the state's math curriculum isn't serving their fourth graders needs or that transportation challenges are causing many students to be chronically absent. Another education partner, like, for example, a researcher who's maybe helping a district leader see if their new tutoring intervention is helping students might need student level data, but they don't need identifiable data. Researchers can often use de-identify data, which is information about individual students, but with the identifying information like name or home address removed. So all in all, different people need different data and privacy laws, guidance and supports need to help education leaders and policymakers at all levels get the data they need for their job while also safeguarding students from risk and protecting their privacy. Excellent. I mean, a question to Rachel about district level use of data, something that's near and dear to our heart, representing superintendents. And uh, part of that answer that really resonated and is so central to our overall federal advocacy is one size doesn't fit all. As you look at the fact that there's 14,000 school districts, let alone the number of schools, sometimes within a district. So really, really important points there. I'd like to pivot now from that district level focus to a question for you, Whitney, and highlighting some of the work uh, in Utah. So Utah has done an incredible job creating safeguards for student privacy, while still allowing for beneficial uses of data and tech that can help students. Please talk a little bit about your approach and what makes it so effective. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, you know, Utah, I have learned, is unique. Uh, and we have a state a chief privacy officer. So that was actually provided in legislation. We're one of the few states that actually have has funding uh, for privacy at the state level. And uh, that really helps uh, us kind of help the LEAs, our local education agencies um, with the work uh, that they need to do. Uh, each uh, district or charter school uh, is required to have a point of contact for privacy. Uh, they must have a data governance plan that includes certain items. We actually collect and read every single uh, of the, I think, 160 uh, district or charter school data governance plans. Uh, we have uh, special contractual requirements uh, when uh, providing information or student personally identifiable information with third parties. 
Uh, and we have, we actually have funding to provide uh, training and uh, resources to help kind of move the needle on privacy. And I think it's been, it's, it's been pretty helpful to have um, some funding and state level support and um, actual collections of evidence of compliance uh, with uh, all of the LEAs who, who already want to do a good job. They just need help knowing exactly what to do. So I hope that helps. Okay, going, it definitely does. And going a little bit off the of script, hearing you say how many of those plans you reviewed in your office, how big is your staff to review that many plans at the local level? We, uh, there are four of us. So that is a lot of work. That's a heavy lift. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so walking a little bit in between the question that I just asked Rachel and the one that Whitney answered, Lori, I want to talk to you about something specific to your role as the Chief Technology Office Officer. You're on the regular dealing with student privacy issues. Can you talk about some of the challenges you face? Yes, um, we we face a, a lot of challenges. Are very broad. There's, um, uh, I I would think that the one of the biggest has to do with educating uh, all of our stakeholders uh, because uh, we have teachers who really have not. We we're not as, in California as advanced as Utah. Uh, we have we have the legislation, but we did not have uh, at a statewide level a concerted effort to. Uh, roll out some of the legislation that is is very good legislation. It's just we don't have the resources to roll it out. One of the first issues um, that we face is uh, educating uh, our administrators, educating our teachers, educating our parents, um, and, and and when necessary, our students. Um, so that is one of the things that we at the county office have really put a lot of effort in for our area because. Uh, one big example in California is what we um, informally called AB 1584, and it is actually Ed Code 49073.1. And 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 <laughs> and and it went into effect in in 2016. Uh, but to this day, we still have LEAs that are struggling with it because again. Um, there was no concerted effort to even tell teachers about this and what it has to do with this apps that collect student data. They have to meet certain provisions. Uh, and to this day, in certain uh, organizations, we have teachers that don't know you can't just download this app and, and have it collect all the student data, that there are guidelines that are in place. So uh, education is one of the big things that I think is really important. And then um, when, when COVID hit and, and we went off uh, site with our, our distance learning, um, some of the things that we ran into, for example, uh, when everyone was passing out hotspots, um, those still need to be filtered. If we're providing uh, internet for the student, whether the student's on campus or at home, we need to filter that. And a lot of um, teachers, a lot of administrators didn't know that, a lot of the vendors didn't know that. Um, and a couple of IT departments, you know, we're just handing them out and it's like, no, you have to put some filtering on that. So a lot of, you know, this is a really, really big uh, question. There's a lot of stuff that we have faced, but if I were to sum it up, I would say education and um, resources to, to, to roll out what we have in the legislation. That's a pretty good note to end on, given that the purpose of today's forum is just education around student data privacy in general. And so it's so much of the conversation at the state and local level. We're getting some questions in the chat box. Do continue to drop them in there. We'll be facilitating Q&A directly from the participants at the conclusion of the prepared questions. So make sure to let us know what it is you want to hear about. So when we're talking about the education that we're doing, this could be about educating educators. It could be about educating parents. But a lot of this conversation is at the nexus of policy. So I'd really be interested in myth busting. Uh, so what are some common myths or misunderstandings around student privacy? And we'll go in that same order. Rachel? Sure. There are a few, but one that I think gets repeated or almost assumed a lot is that by declining to collect or share data at all, we're avoiding risk. Um, but the truth is that data is, is or should be a tool to help students, 
And there is tremendous risk for students in not using every tool we have available to serve them well. So when we declined to think holistically about privacy, both the letter of the law, but also the supports that districts and educators, the training um, that folks need, we are one, not protecting the privacy of the data that we have to collect for compliance and federal purposes, but we're also throwing away the potential of a tool that can really inform equity efforts and efforts to help each individual child thrive. So I think that's probably the biggest one, that if we can get rid of all data, we get rid of risk. We're only introducing a different set of risks. That's an interesting parallel to the response to COVID, right? It's not about eliminate, well, it is about eliminating COVID ideally, but it's risk mitigation, right? A completely eliminating risk doesn't mean you're completely devoid of all risks. It could be a different consideration. Uh, so moving on from Rachel's myth busting, Whitney, which myth are you going to bust? <laughs> um, I would say that HIPAA applies to health records within the school. Uh, that's a question we were asked, especially with COVID. So that's a myth. Also, I think I uh, one of the myths that I um, think Rachel mentioned in some degree was that um, privacy is kind of all or nothing that uh, that's uh, people once they get to learn more about privacy requirements we've learned that kind of the pendulum can swing so far where people were asking if they needed to modify their schools so that no one could possibly see a computer of the registrar for example uh, so kind of understanding that balance between uh, the permissiveness and what um, and not stopping uh, providing those excellent services to students and also kind of following the law and also those best practices. So having that middle ground uh, does exist. And all the best things happen in three. Lori, what's our third myth? Well, I, you know, kind of harping on what I was saying earlier, I think the biggest um, myth for me is that uh, well, it's two of them. Number one, everybody knows exactly what to do uh, without training and, and without co consistent training. The, the laws change, the, the technologies change, and so we should, uh, it's not a one and done uh, when we have any training at all, and it, it should be something that's continual uh, for all of our stakeholders. Our, again, our teachers, our our administrators, our, our technology people, our parents, uh, there should be continual training um, because it, there, there's so much out there and we, we, we everybody doesn't know um, everything. And the second thing is that uh, coming from it from an IT standpoint, that IT can just block stuff and it's all good, you know, that uh, we can flip a magic wand and, you know, and, and we're, we're taking care of some of the privacy issues because we could just block anything that, you know, say has a social security number and, and all that. And some of the myths is that, you know, tech, IT cannot do everything. It's, it's got to, there are some tools that uh, we can employ, but really the biggest tool is, in my opinion, education of the stakeholders. So, Piggybacking off of that, Laura, I actually want to continue with you and transition from this myth busting to a little bit more of a focus on federal policies. So where do you think there are gaps in these federal student privacy regulations? I would say the biggest thing I think is a gap is there, the fact that it hasn't kept up with what we're actually dealing with right now. A lot of the, like if you look at when FERPA was written, um, it was quite a while ago, and it doesn't address uh, things that we're dealing with today in terms of the, the digital nature of a lot of the data that uh, is collected and shared. So I think that the biggest gap is uh, federal, uh, the federal laws not keeping up with what is actually happening today. When I take some initial conversations on the Hill to illustrate that last point you made, we like to point out that FERPA itself was actually only authorized once, and that was like in the mid-70s when student data was written in pencil on paper in the middle of a folder in a filing cabinet. And while regulations have gotten us to where we are now, I like to make a joke to the superintendents that that's totally not what student data is right now. 
And so I think you very gracefully in this il illustrate how much there is room for improvement, but also some common sense flexibility. Uh, so Rachel, gaps in federal policy regulations. I second everything Lori has said. School simply looks different than it did when a lot of these laws were written. Um, and I think going along with that, along the same line, um, we have all these different federal privacy laws that work as they were designed to, but because they were all written at different times when school looked different, they don't fully speak to each other. They don't necessarily use the same de definitions or kind of put forth the same shared vision of what it means to use data or to protect privacy in or out of school. So I'd love to see federal legislators think about how these laws can both be modernized, but also speak to each other a little bit more. Um, and similarly, as uh, Lori and Whitney have both uh, stated so perfectly, um, training and supports are such a big part of privacy protections. Our laws right now are very much focused on compliance and punishment after the fact. There's very little thought given to supports and training up front. And that's something I'd, I'd also think the field would really benefit from. And Whitney, where do you see a gap in federal privacy regulation? Well, uh, these ladies took my answer. Uh, the, uh, you know, it, things are different. I'm actually excited that we were given this opportunity to see all of these technological changes this last year because it brought to the surface things that we have already known about. Um, the definition of that FERPA uses of having an education record being maintained is now unclear. Uh, and, you know, when we look at these privacy laws at the federal level, level um, they're about kind of protecting records. Um, uh, FERPA in, in particular is about protecting records, not so much about protecting students. And so how are you going to be more nimble when we have a bunch of cameras and surveillance technology coming up? Um, I, don't, I don't see that as, uh, I don't see our current state of federal law really addressing that. That's what happened. I guess it's good though, when you have three speakers identifying some of the similar themes, I think the work of regulation and law would be a lot harder if everyone was going in 10 disparate directions, right? So as much as there's room for improvement, it's nice to see a little bit of continuity direct from the field. I'd like to bring the conversation back to a district level, and I'm going to start with you, Rachel, and this is a, a two-part question. So in our conversations with, with districts, we heard them express concerns about new federal student privacy laws or regulations, particularly when no funding accompanies these new requirements. So two questions here. Do you share those concerns? And regardless of how you answer that, what do policymakers need to keep in mind as they think about changing or updating student privacy laws and regulations? Yeah, I do share those concerns and I'm interested to hear Lori and Whitney answer this question as well. Um, I think what policymakers should keep in mind is something that Noel, you and Whitney both mentioned earlier, which is that the vast majority of educators are extremely well intentioned and the vast majority of privacy violations in a school or district are caused by simple human error, not malicious intent. So it's usually something like a teacher uses the same password for every student's gradebook login, or a school counselor does some work on a laptop at a coffee shop with insecure Wi-Fi. Um, it's usually not a, a malicious privacy attack. So I worry when our privacy laws are not looking to the training and supports that would help well-intentioned educators and education leaders just do their job correctly in the first place rather than looking to um, punish or enforce after the fact. Um, data use, data privacy, and larger data literacy should be something that we're supporting at the state and local levels, not something that we're expecting teachers to somehow pick up on themselves as they're also expected to protect privacy. Following up on that, Lori, both of those questions. Do you share these cost burden concerns? And what advice do you have to policymakers for things they should keep at front of mind? 
Well, I very much uh, share those concerns and, and Rachel summed up a whole lot of the reasons why um, uh, um, uh, that I think uh, we, we, we share these concerns out in the field. Um, what we saw, you know, or what we see many times when, when these laws are passed are unfunded mandates because somebody has to, um, to, to implement these laws, somebody somewhere. I mean, no matter what law you pass, no, in whatever area, there has to be some type of implementation. So when these laws are passed, there's somebody um, that just got something dropped in their lap and that takes away from something else. So the first thing I would say is that the lawmakers need to really think through the implementation and it does there need to be funding because I think you said it earlier, um, Noel, or maybe it was Amelia, I don't remember who, uh, but I heard today already that if the law is passed, but it's not implemented it's correctly, then what's the point? Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that um, when they're passing laws, particularly those that um, address the, the vendors, the, the uh, people that are providing these services that we're buying these services from, um, that they keep in mind that, um, they, they're, they're, we understand that they're out there to make money and they're going to make money. But if you're passing laws that are going to be almost unreasonable in the way the law is framed, it, it, that, that the company is going to back back from it because if it's going to uh, cause undue um, you know, cost for them, then they may have a service or a product that really will help students. But if the law is written in such a way that it makes it difficult for them to um, do business, then that, that service may not be available or that, that product may not be available. And so I think that all of this can be done, but there needs to be more input from the people with boots on the ground. Um, because a lot of times I don't think that the lawmakers who are not operating daily in this space understand what some of what they're trying to do and they're, what they're trying to do is right, don't get me wrong, but how that's really going to look when it gets to somebody like at my level where we're actually implementing, we're actually working with the vendors and we're running into all these issues and the people that suffer the most are the kids that they don't get what they need. Mm -hmm. And so from boots on the ground to you, Whitney, at the state level, where the State Board of Education itself can sometimes be a policymaker, uh, where do you share the concerns related to cost burden? And what do policy keep, policymakers need to keep in mind? You know, I'm really grateful to Utah uh, for actually providing funding for privacy. And um, I thought about why they did, uh, because I didn't know about being a chief privacy officer, it's a really, for an SEA, it's a very new position. And I thought, I think that they did because they can see problems coming in the future if they don't get it together sooner than later, uh, that they're being proactive. And uh, they're being proactive because they recognize that you actually need some expert knowledge on all of these laws that Amelia just went through. And you need some type of funding with reasonable expectations. And what Lori's mentioned over and over again, I'll have to agree with is training is key. And so because we're in a good position, we have created in Utah, a number of resources that I knew at the time we needed to generalize to help our other states that aren't as fortunate. And so, please just like, like all educators do, steal, steal, steal. Uh, take those resources, make them your own. But we, I intentionally created, created resources that are accurate, that are brief, because no one has time for this, and that are somewhat entertaining, slightly silly from time to time. But, uh, but educators really, really enjoy those. So um, we'll share with you all of those materials. I know they're used in other states. Uh, there you go, a bunch of resources. Uh, so please just take everything you want, make it your own. We're even able to give you kind of raw formats of the things we've developed in these videos. And you can just uh, 
uh, alter them through uh, Adobe or whatever products. Like we, we wanna, we really wanna share uh, the funding that we've been given, the resources we've developed. So yeah, amen to everyone else. <laughs> And for everyone following along in the Zoom room, if you're not in the chat, please make sure that to chat because the resources that are being referenced by Rachel and Lori and Whitney are being dropped there uh, for your reference and perusal. Okay, we could have the best policy in the world where these policymakers consider, keep all the considerations in mind and get their policy right. Doesn't mean anything if it's not implemented well and with fidelity. So I wanted to switch the conversation to a little bit more about implementation. So passing this new law or regulation is the first step. What are some of the other critical factors for schools to successfully implement these student privacy protections? We'll do Lori, Rachel, then Whitney. Um, this follows along with uh, my continual harping about training and it's similar. It's, um, just the messaging, uh, when, when a new law comes out, how do you communicate this law? You know, even before you get to the training, how do you communicate to the stakeholders that the law has, uh, is, is in effect, when is it effect, uh, why, it, what, what, what is it that this particular law is addressing um, that other existing laws don't. And then from there, we'll get into the training of the appropriate stakeholders. But uh, again, just take picking up from the experience that we had in California with AB 1584, uh, it, it, and again, it was it's it, it was definitely right on time. It's a wonderful law, but the number of people, the number of years it took for those of us in the field to get the message out to the appropriate stakeholders that this law is in effect uh, was it was it was it was crazy uh, because uh, there there really wasn't messaging. And then the other piece, I think, in terms of factors, and and I think that. Uh, um, Rachel or Whitney hit, hit on this a little bit when talking about federal laws, making sure that the laws are kind of, um, you know, they, that they're using the same language and that they complement what's already there. Sometimes it's like you have this stack of laws, lawmakers are making laws and they kind of stack on top of each other and they really don't uh, complement each other as well as they should. So that's a factor that should go into um, probably before the law is passed, what's already there and how, what are we, what's left that we're trying to address and how can we complement what's already there rather than just kind of put something on top of what's already existing. So. Rachel? Yeah, if you haven't heard it enough already today, I would say also training and supports um, to actually help the implementation go well. But I would also flag the need for ongoing kind of thought partnership to education leaders and policymakers about how and whether to do the things that they are interested in doing. So if a superintendent wants to share some limited academic data with a tutoring program in the community who's working with a lot of their students, they don't really have anyone that they can call and say, how do I do this right? How do I set up this agreement? What's appropriate to share? How should I be thinking about this? Um, and that's really true for, for most people in a district or a school or even a state, like there just isn't a clear expert to call and kind of think through these decisions, especially beyond the letter of the law. Um, the US Department of Education has some fantastic resources, their privacy technical uh, education, PTAC, Privacy Technical Assistance Center, is absolutely fantastic. They have lots of great resources, but by design, a large part of their role is around compliance and enforcement. And they probably don't literally have the time to talk to every teacher who's interested in an app, but doesn't know if, what to consider, or every superintendent who wants to share data with another district because they're working on something together. Um, there's just, a lack of guidance and support and people who can help educators and leaders think through these questions. Whitney? Well, I think policymakers really need to recognize that privacy is super dynamic and the potential uses and abuses are going to increase over the years as technology gets a little bit more sophisticated. I mean, 
I remember when I was young, I don't, I couldn't imagine watching a show on a device that small from about anywhere. Like it blows my mind uh, to think about that because I remember VHS tapes anyway. Uh, but there's also um, legislation is important. It's not just the funding. Uh, I noticed after thinking, after looking through the best practices that a lot of the best practices that we have uh, are just required in our Utah state law. So if you look at the, the requirements for IDEA data handling, uh, that they're required to have a governance plan, I believe, I might be making this up now, uh, but they're required to train staff on this. Those kind of best practices and requirements for IDEA were kind of put into Utah's law saying, hey, we're not just recommending these, we're requiring these, but we're going to give you help. And um, I think it was Rachel that mentioned you need someone to contact uh, at the state. And I just about 20 minutes ago got a text from someone, hey, will you answer this question about uh, Google for the classroom? And, and it's nice to have someone to, and I'm going to call them later, uh, so to, to, to talk through these issues. Because I know the answer, because I've been asked this many, many times. Uh, so laws. Um, that more clearly regulate vendors are also important. Why does it have to do with uh, education to have all of these standards? I want to, I don't, I wasn't here for the earlier session, but a shout out to the Student Data Privacy Consortium, where they're, they've made it much easier uh, to have these contractual obligations for third party vendors and uh, we are pressuring those vendors to make changes and we even have an auditor to make sure that they're following through with that. And so use those existing resources uh, and, um, and, and try to make it easy. Our goal is to make privacy easier on, on educators and administrators. Okay. Pass good laws, write good regulation, implement with fidelity. Super easy. I think we'll be done by Friday, right? <laughs> so, Rachel, I want to steer back to you, and it's a re repetitive question because it's based on this idea of what do legislators need to keep in mind to ensure that student data at the state and local levels effectively informs policies with the added consideration of while ensuring equity. So, can you build that layer of context into the question or to your answer? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll try to be brief because I know that we're coming to the end of our time. Um, but as we've touched on it a couple different places earlier in this conversation, education data is and should be really a tool for helping to identify inequities and helping to redress them. We've seen that really clearly reflected in ESSA, which requires states to disaggregate and report um, a lot of data about different student populations. That even that requirement in and of itself really requires more guidance and support for states and districts uh, submitting data because sometimes those populations are very small and it's not clear how to report data while still protecting privacy. That's a perfect example of a place where legislators need to think not just about the letter of the law of what it looks like to protect privacy, but how do you provide supports and guidance so that states and districts can use and report data related to equity without compromising privacy, especially the privacy of students who may already be disadvantaged by our existing systems. Um, that's really an important consideration going forward. Um, and it kind of comes back again to this idea that we've talked about many times of the importance of providing upfront supports and guidance rather than focusing solely on um, enforcement or punishments that may come after an accident. Right. Okay, I'm going to enter into the final prepared question and then we have a couple in the chat timing allowed. I'm actually going to be pretty strict about ending at 150. So we'll see how this goes. Final question. We'll start with you, Whitney. What are the most important considerations, considerations policymakers should take into account when approaching student privacy related legislation or regulations? 
I would say that privacy is often the afterthought to other legislation. I know that there's standalone kind of privacy legislation, but kind of woven within other legislation are privacy considerations that legislators don't really think about. Um, and also, I think that um, lawmakers, policymakers need to know that you can be more restrictive than FERPA, but not uh, more free, even though they want kind of things done, there, there is usually a path that's appropriate uh, that they might not know about. Uh, and that is, it's kind of complicated. And uh, they need to, if they want something done right, they need to kind of be proactive and fund this, uh, because uh, a data breach is only a matter of time. And, uh, you know, education is built on trust and uh, taking care of these kids and uh, truly that lives are at stake. Uh, and it's, it is really that serious uh, for some students. It's a very small number of students, thankfully, but uh, we, this last year we had some pretty interesting things happen and we need to make sure that these kids are really protected uh, and you need to put money where your mouth is. Lori? I, I'm not sure that there's much more that I could add to that, except that, um, I mean, that, that was a great answer by Whitney and I really, um, you, know, you know, just say that what she said is exactly uh, what I would say too. You know, just the thought that student data privacy is so important from the standpoint of, um, if you are as you or I as an adult, if our if our privacy is violated, uh, we probably would, you know, especially if somebody's doing something with it, like opening an account in our name or whatever, we will know about it fairly quickly. Um, students' data can be violated, and um, their their um, if, if their data are sold on the black market or whatever, that can happen, and you have to ask yourself. When is that student going to find out about it? Especially, you know, say this is, uh, you know, first grader, or second grader. So they, it really, really is important for us to take it seriously, to, to do it right, do it well, uh, because the kids, these children don't have any real protections uh, and, and no way of knowing um, if we're not doing it right. So just the seriousness of, of, the, of the issue. Mm -hmm. And then Rachel. Yeah, again, just completely second everything that Whitney and Lori have said. Um, and if I could leave folks uh, looking at the federal role with three thoughts, um, they would be to um, ensure that our all the federal laws that cover students and young people like FERPA, PPRA, ESRA, COPPA, HIPAA, provide a really strong and aligned foundation um, that reflect the modern ways that school is happening and that technology is being used um, and relate to each other. Uh, secondly, along with the actual laws to ensure that there's coordination across federal agencies to provide guidance and clarity on how all the laws work together and, and how local and state level policymakers can implement them correctly. Um, and third, again, to support state and local capacity to safeguard data themselves. Um, the federal government can do much more there by providing tools and guidance and funding for training, um, best practices. There's really a lot of ways to help states and districts do this work in addition to providing federal law. And so on that note, something that Rachel said that I think is a wonderful way to close this panel, since it is 149, so we are regrettably at end of our time together. There's a lot of conversation about how these individual federal privacy laws and regulations don't happen in a silo, but I think it warrants uh, a specification that privacy doesn't happen in a silo either. And I think Whitney and Lori made reference to that as well. It's in the context of assessment and standards and funding and instruction and curriculum. And so while it was a multifaceted conversation here, it's truly, there are many more facets to it. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I'd like to thank you very much, Rachel, Whitney, and Lori, for sharing your time and expertise with us. I'm going to return it back to our to my co-host Amelia for our next event portion. <laughs>